Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and to share uh, some of my work with you. <clears throat> my name is Wael Morkos. I'm a graphic and type designer from Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also a partner at the Brooklyn-based studio Morkos Key. Um, as of last uh, week, on February 22nd, our studio is one year old. Um, yay! <laughs> That's a vanity picture from our launch party last year. Our studio focuses on visual identities in print and digital systems for arts and cultural institutions, nonprofits, and commercial enterprises in North America and in the Middle East. Uh, going too fast. There are some of the. There's going to be a quick overview of some of our work. Then I'm going to delve a little bit more in a couple of projects. Um, we consider language one of the fundamental tools in a designer's toolbox. So our work spans from identity design to editorial work. Um, this is an example of, uh, of our, one of our clients, Heartbeat Opera, a young and radical opera group based in Brooklyn. Um, we created an identity that mixes collage and brush letterings, and we've been working with them uh, for the last couple of years, creating campaigns for their uh, upcoming shows. <clears throat> they are uh, really expressive in the way they take the classical canon of opera and reinvent it and re-drag it out, if you will, for today's um, audience. This is a logo for a bakery uh, by Syrian refugee in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, and we try to use type to tell the stories of our clients. Here's a logo for a studio based in Saudi Arabia. Um, and comes with that logo system of bilingual typography where we used uh, the idea of centering the logo as a way to uh, solve the uh, problem of justification and using t different scripts that go in different directions. Um, Slate TV is a queer digital platform that amplifies the LGBTQ uh, video content online. Um, and today I'm gonna share three design projects and look at the historic narratives that surrounded them specifically to look at ways design and type have coexisted and their relationship uh, to my design practice today. Um, I like to look back at history and be inspired by it to kind of uh, solve problems and uh, understand why modern graphic design looks the way it is and what defines it and what makes it actually modern. Uh, my journey with type goes back to 2010 when I was involved in the project called Typographic Matchmaking in the City 2. Um, I'm the blurred person in the blue. <laughs> um, unlike typographic matchmaking one, in the second project, they wanted to pair up designers from the Middle East and uh, Amsterdam. Um, and the idea is for them to create bilingual typography from scratch, so as a way to uh, level the, the playing field and see how the process inspires one or the other. I warned you it's 10 years ago. so. This is me in the middle. On my right is uh, Richard Wagner the, uh, Wagner, the architect, and my uh, type design partner on my left, Artur Schmal. We were uh, invited to be inspired by the uh, city of Dubai, but to me, honestly, it was a little bit overwhelming. And a lot of what I was looking at, I failed to understand why it looked the way it did or how it came that way. So I was, um, it was not a great start for me to try to solve all these problems at once. Instead, I found inspiration back in the Museum um, of Islamic Calligraphy in Sharjah. These are one of the oldest forms of Arabic writing. It's called the Kufic style, the archaic Kufi. It's believed to have developed in uh, a town called Kufa, which is modern day Iraq. The leaves from this Quran written in gold and contoured with brown ink have a horizontal format. So a lot of these Qurans that were written in that script have a, a landscape layout, if you will. But what drew me to that is uh, something that felt really modern, despite that it being one of the earliest Arabic script. Um, in fact, if you look at it, it's one of these uh, scripts that have a straight baseline. It doesn't have any cascading uh, baselines. It does have letters that fuse on top of each other, but it has a very uh, clear vertical rhythm. And it also had a contrast of thinner uh, horizontals and thicker verticals, which was closer to Latin typography. So um, it was a way to reconcile a lot of these uh, problems and felt to me like a good starting point. Also, I was really in love with these funky elongations within the letters that were used to justify some lines and create uh, a rhythm on the page. Um, the classification of Latin typography does not apply the same way it does to Arabic. Um, 
but they're roughly translated into two big categories, the fluid scripts and the uh, solid sc uh, scripts. So when it came to the Latin inspiration, Arthur uh, brought back some vernacular lettering from Amsterdam. And what he was drawn about is some quirkiness and, of, and, and the vernacular of the imbalanced letters. Do you see all of the proportions are really big on top? Um, although these, the uh, original Kufi and the lettering of Amsterdam have not really a lot of, in common, the fact they were inspired by two cities was enough for us to start, which prompted the design process um, of this uh, simultaneously sketching together and when a process of one uh, designer informed the process of the other. <clears throat> So Arturi included formal references to the human hand in slight glyphic flares at the terminals, producing a beaky corner where the short stems would otherwise have been. The, the, eventually we call the font Kufam for Kufa and Amsterdam, so we join them together. Kufam also came with stylistic sets that allowed these to bring back this elongation into the script. Kufam was eventually published by our type, a type foundry, Unfortunately, uh, our type closed last year, but eventually Kufam got picked up by Google Fonts and it's gonna be republished soon. Uh, we're now uh, redrawing Kufam and fixing it after, um, I think people say that uh, type designer's first typeface is never finished. So this gave me the chance to kind of revisit um, some proportions and fix some details that we're not extremely happy about. Kufam exists in five weights and is meant to be used as display and text of medium length. It's not the cursive Arabic that would be to normally used for long texts. <clears throat> and something that I would want to give uh, and try to explore is see if this font will make a good uh, uh, contender to become a variable font, which is also a new innovation for Arabic typography. Um, I'm new in this area, so but I did ask around a little bit, and as far as I know, there's yet no known published Arabic variable font. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There has been... Yes, we have to talk. <laughs> I'll give you my number. Um, I've seen a lot of exercises where people have used... Um, uh, interpolation to play with the cachet and the elongations. Uh, we're facing a little bit of technical problems of the right to left support in some Adobe softwares. So this is the crux of where we are, but hopefully this will be released soon and available and it will be fun to play with. Um, another story that also bridges kind of different cities is um, an idea that brings back storytelling uh, from Africa to uh, America. Um, the next story connects these two cities, and recently, actually last month, the Library of Congress announced that it has acquired and made available online the Omar ibn Said collection, which consists of 42 original documents in both English and Arabic. The centerpiece of this collection is a manuscript, the only known surviving narrative written in Arabic by an enslaved person in the United States. In 1807, age 37, Omar ibn Said, a wealthy and highly educated man who was captured in West Africa, which is modern day Senegal, was brought to the United States as a slave. After sailing for a month, he arrived in Charleston, South Carolina, where he was bought, uh, bought, bought by a man who apparently was cruel to him. So he eventually escaped, was recaptured and landed in jail in North Carolina. He was discovered and eventually taken into the household of Jim Owen and his brother John Owen, the governor of North Carolina with whom he remained until his death in his late 80s. The memoir is ink on paper written in a Maghrebi script or Moroccan uh, Arabic style, uh, a style that's very common in that area in North Africa. When few enslaved people uh, knew how to write in the United States, one man wrote his memoir in Arabic. His handwritten account is important not only because it tells the personal story of a slave written by himself, but also because it documents an aspect of the early history of Islam and Muslims in the United States. Because it was in Arabic, this biography was not edited by Said's owner, as those of other slaves written in English were. And it is therefore more candid, more haunting maybe, but also more authentic. His native language became the code that preserved his story. Um, these early documentation of narratives are what also excited me to work on this next project. Um, 
documentation of Arab American narratives is something that I'm really interested in. One of my clients, Mizna, documents Arab American stories through prose, poetry, and art. Mizna is an organization with the mission to bring Arabic American arts to life and support the vision of Arab American artists. Um, I This is a typical identity branding exercise that uh, I've worked on with Mizna. Um, they were really attached to the logo they had, and they believed it needs a lot of work. It was very inconsistent across their different uh, activities, from their film festival, their printed journal, their events, and the podcasts they do. Um, here I went back to the um, geometric kufi, which is very abstract and meant to be not read in long text, but inscribed and uh, as sculpture on buildings. But it's a, such, a, such an abstract script, it is very appealing to create logos and abstraction and little words with it. So that logo you see on top was redrawn to highlight the symmetry in it and to create something that is still simple and uh, memorable. <clears throat> um, it was not enough to just give them a logo. They clearly needed a system that allows them to deploy this new identity. So I went back to a way to bring that logo to life and looked back at the calligraphy and what is known in Arabic as tatwil or in Persian as kashida which is, again, this elongation between letters that connects them. This is usually used for either justification purposes or sometimes when it's used in excess, it can be, it can be lent for like titling or uh, some drama. <clears throat> so I went back into that and then brought back the logo and applied that kind of elongation to the logo and to see how much we can actually distress the logo as a way to bring it some sort of vitalism and activism and make it dynamic, but also to give them a system that allows them to simply apply the logo on all their material. So here the, the idea is that the logo would always be centered at the, uh, and uh, anchored at the top of the layout or the page, whether it's a screen or a printed artifact. And the rest of the uh, information is uh, pretty straightforward, flesh left, and the text is separated from the pictures. That kind of system helped them to be able to carry it and around in their communication pieces from the website to the journals and to uh, not need a very complex in-house design team to be able to uh, apply the identity. We uh, brought that idea and applied it to some of their other uh, activities like the Arab Film Festival. So the elongation here is applied, not part of the drawn logo, but to a typeface. And the logo has two signatures and is the stacked one, whether it's horizontal or vertical, also remem uh, reminds of the uh, a film being screened and the motion of um, the images scrolling throughout the lens of the light of the projector. We were inspired by olive uh, branches to create the Laurel Awards uh, signature. This is the latest issue. Uh, it was printed, I think, last week, so it's actually available, and the identity has started being deployed. Um, but that project um, got me really curious even more into trying to dig um, in the history and to try to uncover more relationships between the history of the United States and the Arabic script. So Omar, the uh, slave that we talked about, actually died in 1863, and he is buried in Plantation's graveyard of General Owen. Now, one year later, in 1864, a little bit up north, Homan Hallock, a New York-based American type designer and typographer, created the first documented, unified, and isolated Arabic font design. As you know, Arabic is a connected script, and each letter differs in its shape based on where it is in the word, which make Arabic a very uh, extensive character set. It was really hard to uh, reproduce, to have matrices that fill all these letters. So who better to come up with a simplified Arabic than the person who spent agonizing years punching, cutting one Arabic typeface of a thousand letter variations? But Arabic has had a contentious history with the printed word, which relied on technology often invented with the Western script mechanics in mind. Al Huda newspaper that we see here started in Brooklyn around 1920s. It was one of the first printing presses in the world to mechanize Arabic metal typesetting. Um, Assyrian diaspora was also very present and active in uh, Manhattan. And this is one example of, uh, that was published, I think, around 19, oh, 1919. It's the uh, Syrian American Commercial Magazine. 
it's inter inter you can see when you look at the titling that you see sometimes cuts when the letters connect, and uh, evidence as metal type trying to uh, you know behave in a way that connects all the letters together. The intrigu intriguingly beautiful calligraphic principles of Arabic script have long defied attempts to facilitate mass production. It's as if the type design of a certain language is itself a political struggle for the right to exist. Homan Halleck was not the only one who explored the idea of detached and simplified Arabic. One of the other people, there's a lot, but we're not going to delve into all of them, but one of them is Nasri Khattar, a Lebanese-American architect who devoted the second rest of his life to simplify the Arab, Arabic script, convinced that it was necessary to fight illiteracy in the Middle East. His concept was simple. If you look on the paragraph on the left and you look, locate the loop with a dot on top of it, that's the fe. You will see that it takes different shapes depending on where it is on the word, in the word. On the paragraph on the right, that same letter appears exactly the same way. So he simplified, he took a lot of details off, discarded them, and created a detached version of the Arabic. <clears throat> uh, people who already knew Arabic found it really hard to adapt and to learn that new system. But surveys and tests that he did attest that people who did not know Arabic were faster to learn the language using the new simplified system. His efforts caught the eyes of the head of IBM at the time, Thomas Watson himself, who organized a lunch in the prestigious Waldorf Astoria Hotel, setting Kamal Khattar and connecting him with dignitaries relevant to his project. He also equipped Khattar with six brand new IBM typewriters bearing his new alphabet. Here is a letter uh, on the uh, letterhead of IBM in Arabic using both scripts, the connected one on the right and the new alphabet of Qatar on the left. From the 1940s onward, Qatar would spend the rest of his life vigorously promoting his new alphabet, producing everything from children's book with side-by-side -side comparison to short educational movies, to metal casting his alphabet, but as technology advanced, it soon became a solution to a non-existing problem, not to mention the political uh, tension he received for trying to uh, amend a script that considered by a lot of people holy and sacred. Last year, under the direction of Mike Abing, who I think uh, was here on stage and he spoke about IBM Plex, um, I was invited to take part of their design team that has started designing a new corporate typeface for IBX, IBM Plex, which you mentioned. The reason, of course, is to cut off uh, the million dollars in um, licensing fees, but also to try to create a new face and a unified brand typographic look for the brand. These kind of projects happen uh, over Skype. This is one of our sessions. I'm on top in the middle. Um, it's a global team assembled with the goal to create something that's global, versatile, and distinctly IBM. This typeface was designed uh, with Khajak Apelion KJ on the bottom right, uh, my co-designer who is based in Beirut. Uh, like any matchmaking, for uh, use that in quote, because matchmaking is a very elastic word, uh, project, the goal to me is two things. First, uh, try to create something that are more visually um, looks like the original design, but most importantly, something that operates like the original design. I design typefaces with uh, the goal for graphic designers to use them. And I imagine uh, complex grids and layout and editorial systems where one typeface behaves the, in one way, a counterpart can also take that same uh, uh, importance on the page, whether it's headlines, text, or captions. The original design was inspired by Paul Rand's logo. The first detail borrowed was the slap serif on the left. Um, the second one was the right angle inside the curve that contrasted with the uh, soft curve on the outside. And some other pointy details from the uh, apex of the M. <clears throat> what IBM wanted is a grotesque typeface they can call their own that captured the ethos of the company that sought to connect the man with the machine. So they describe it as distinctive yet timeless, an alternative to Helvetica Nua for his, <clears throat> and is designed for a new era. Translating the design to Arabic required close attention to details, from connection points and ink traps 
but also to setting up a param parameter for the brief. So if the IBM Plex is, uh, can be used as a text font, it was important to establish for ourselves a brief for the Arabic. So it was important that the Arabic can also be used fairly easily for longer texts, uh, which is why we based it on the Nasr. Uh, the most common uh, style for Arabic for long readings. We then go through a series of different exercises. So we break down the whole design process and we built it up from a whole different perspective. It's a long process, but I'll speed through some of the most important parts of it. First of all, reversing the contrast because of the thick baseline and slanted baseline of the Arabic. Second of all, looking at the area that we call X height for the Latin, but uh, there's no X in Arabic, so there's no X height. We look at diacritic dots. Uh, diamonds are very common in Arabic, but a lot of uh, different scripts also had round dots, so there's also room to play in that aspect. We looked at all the closed shapes, the counters in the Latin, and all the triangular loops of the Arabic. We looked at the rhythm of the vertical stems and the nebiras in the Arabic. And one common, dis uh, very distinctive aspect of IBM was the, again, the flat on the inside and circular on the outside. We look at other the typographic detailing, like the halyas and the end of the strokes in the Arabic, and these could be uh, places where what the Latin interprets as serifs could be uh, mirrored or, in, or played around with. <clears throat> so after um, a big distinctive aspect is that flat inside, and since Arabic is connected and it's on a horizontal side, we had to find a way to create that same thing where the letters connect horizontally on the baseline. Eventually, the typeface was created in eight weights. It's in uh, its last stages now. It supports 68 languages um, and has over a thousand uh, glyphs. We also included some uh, religious glyphs uh, that is, are used in religious type settings. These are some promotional uh, graphics for the typeface. In a way, uh, this is a little bit experimental for Arabic. It has a lot of features that are not commonly present in the Arabic, but type design to me is a mixture of science, technology, and conventions. Um, and conventions are uh, personal sometimes, but also adapted in terms of trends and appeal. Um, what I'm excited about this is that this typeface will be available also for free. So I'm also excited once it's released to see what people are going to be doing with that typeface. <clears throat> I'm working on another exciting project that I'm testing a new thesis. I'm just going to show a sneak peek. Lyon Arabic from commercial type is Lyon is being translated to Arabic. Um, there's no italics in Arabic, but if you remember the slide I showed previously, we use different scripts to create hierarchies. So if we wanted to create a hierarchy in line, what we can do is perhaps redraw the whole scripts based on or inspired by Nostali, which has a very much more fluid um, baseline and character. So um, the Lyon italic will be entirely redrawn like a cursive Latin. And um, this project is in its final stages as well. And I'm also very excited to see how it's going to be used. The following slides are more examples of my work. Um, including the Arabic lettering workshop series created by Khazak Apelian, Christian Serkis, and myself, the last of which happened a couple of weeks ago, number 12 at the TDC, and the concept and the theme for that one was New York, New York, New York. As I embraced a duality of formal expression and functional identity system and navigated design practice fueled by client work and personal projects, I find myself asking the same questions. What does modern Arabic graphic design look like? <clears throat> and how can we communicate these qualities and these conventions to a, a market that is also asking the same questions? How can we build on historical narratives and bring these references into the future? How do we connect local stories with our cos cosmopolitan lives today? There's no clear answer, but we cannot define modernity without understanding the stories of the past. Thank you. <clears throat>